Well, a pleasant morning to each of you. We're delighted you've tuned in this morning and that we have this opportunity to study the Word of God together. We're mindful many cannot be in the assembly today due to the health risk of the COVID-19 virus, yet we're delighted that you've tuned in and that you're making a study of the Word of God. Our hope and our prayer is that we're all building ourselves up in the most holy faith, and that is through prayer and study of the Word of God and doing those things that give Him glory. We're mindful of those who are sick and having health issues. We have many at O'Neill dealing with such, and you're in our thoughts and in our prayers. And our minds go to those who are grieving. Our hearts go out to you. We weep with you over the loss of a loved one. We sorrow with you, and we're praying for you. If you have any spiritual needs, you contact us any time, day or night. And if you'd like to be baptized, we can meet you at the building or somewhere where there's enough water to bury you into Christ for the remission of sins. And you can be added to the family of God. Enjoy every spiritual blessing in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and have rejoicing because you're a child of the Most High God. If you take your Bible, turn with me to the book of Genesis and the 6th chapter. You'll remember on this occasion a very familiar story where God instructed Noah to build the ark. And I'm sure that most are familiar with that story, but I want to read several verses for the thought that I would like to present at this time. I recognize there are many great sermons that could be presented from this particular chapter and many wonderful lessons indeed that we could apply. But when you read in the book of Genesis in the 6th chapter, beginning at verse 5, I want us to look down through verse 8. And notice what the Bible says. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, as you make a study of the book of Genesis and the 6th chapter this morning, I want us to look at four eternal principles that God has laid down. Four eternal things that you will find are true today just as they were in Noah's day. And when I say eternal, I mean throughout all the ages of the earth. And you'll find these principles true in our day today. The first thing I want you to think about is when you study the Bible, the Word of God, and read Genesis chapter 6, you'll find that sin grieves God. And you can mark that down this morning, that that is an eternal principle in every age, in every dispensation. Sin is a grief to God. It grieves the heart of God. Here God made man, and man has violated and rebelled and defied the will of God. And notice at this time it doesn't take a scholar to recognize God's disappointment with sin. And sin is something we should not make light of because God does not make light of it. In fact, the business has stirred up his wrath and the Bible says he was sorry he made man. And you know, my friend, I never find in the Word of God where that statement's ever recanted. But do you recognize, my friend, that the sin of man grieves the heart of God. And God said, I will destroy man. But you ever thought about that back in the book of Genesis and the third chapter? That God made Adam and Eve and He put them in the garden and He gave them a couple of things to do that were blessings. He said, you tend to the garden, be fruitful and multiply. But He gave them one prohibition, one rule. Some people say, oh, if I only had to do one thing, then I would do that for God. You know, my friend, I don't know. Because look at Adam and Eve. They were told one thing not to do. Do not eat of the tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of good knowledge of good and evil. And you know, my friends, Satan came and that serpent spoke to them, and he convinced Eve to partake of the fruit, and she gave to her husband, and he ate of the fruit. And my friend, they violated the will of God, and God despised what they did. God hates sin. 
God removed them from the garden. There's always a consequence to sin. And notice, my friend, because of the sin of Adam and Eve, we live in a fallen world. That paradise on earth has been removed. And here they had everything that their hearts desire, but they rebelled against God. And they only had one thing God said not to do. And they did not keep that one thing. Have you ever thought about the sin of Adam and Eve? And God said, get out of the garden. And God put a flaming angel there with a sword, making sure that they did not enter back in. But then I want you to think about Sodom and Gomorrah. These two cities were living in the filth of sin. In Genesis 18 and 19, you'll find they were engaged in about every kind of immoral act one could think of. And whatever the sin is, whether it be homosexuality, whether it be uh, marriage uh, or sex before marriage, whatever it may be, drunkenness, lying, gossip, whatever it may be, one thing we need to remember is God does not look lightly upon sin. And God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of their sin. Why? Because sin grieves God. But then, how much did it grieve Him? Have you ever just stopped to think about how much does sin grieve God? It grieved Him enough to allow His only begotten Son to leave heaven, put on robes of flesh, and go to a cross and die. In John 3 and verse 16, you remember what Jesus did and what Jesus said? Jesus said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believeth on Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. He gave His only begotten Son. God loves man, but He hates sin. Look in your Bible for just a moment in the book of Matthew in the 26th chapter. And when you come to the book of Matthew in the 26th chapter, look at verse 28. When Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper just think about the statement made in verse 28. This is my blood of the new covenant. Not the dispensation that Noah lived in. Not under the Mosaic dispensation, but the one that Jesus established the last age. Notice he said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Underscore remission of sins. Oh, I would that I could get into the heart of people. An eternal principle of God is that He hates sin. It grieves God. And He hates sin so much, He sent His Son so His Son could eradicate it and be a substitution. He could be the one to die, to be a sacrifice, so that we can be reconciled to God. And that's what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 5. But that brings up a second thought. Not only is sin grievous to God. But the second principle that you can put down that is eternal is God's patience is limited. Notice that at this time that God told Noah to build the ark. And if you ever wondered how long it took Noah to build the ark, most scholars say about a hundred years if not longer. And notice just what was Noah doing during this time. In 2 Peter 2, 5, you remember Peter called him a preacher of righteousness. He was preaching to the people, God's going to send a flood. God's going to destroy man. You need to get into the ark that I'm building, and you will be saved. And you know the people smocked at that. The people scoffed at that. Take your Bible, if you will, kindly, and turn with me to 1 Peter in the third chapter. And when you come to 1 Peter chapter 3, notice again in his first epistle that Peter makes reference to Noah. And notice what he said about Noah in verses 20 and 21. Who were formerly disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now then, when you look in your Bible, while the ark was being prepared, Noah was preaching. Get in. Notice God didn't immediately send the flood. He gave man time to repent. He gave man a chance to change. He gave man an opportunity to change his attitude and his life and his mind and his will to be conformed to the will of God. But God's patience was limited. God gave a time and God said, that's it. 
same was true with Adam or with uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember, Abraham went and dapped down the streets trying to find righteous people. He started with 50 and he came down to 10 and he said, can I find 10 righteous people in the city? God, would you spare the city? And God said, I'll spare it if you find 10. And he couldn't even find 10 people in the city of Saul. And you know what, my friend? God was patient, but his patience ran out. Look again at another example. Turn in your Bible to the book of Numbers for just a moment. In Numbers chapter 14. And look, if you will, at Numbers 14, beginning at verse 27. And look at what God said. God said, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints which the children of Israel made against me. And notice what God says. As I live, says the Lord, just as you've spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in the wilderness. All of you who were numbered according to your entire number, from 20 years old and above, except Caleb and the son, the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Dun. Now why? God gave them blessing after blessing, and all they did was complain, and God said, How long? How long shall I continue with this evil people? People of God complaining. His patience wore out, and that's an eternal principle of God. In Second Peter 3, you remember the people are mocking and scoffing, saying, Where is the coming of the Son of God? You say He's coming again? Why hasn't He already come? And you remember what they said in verse 9? You remember that Peter said, God's not slack concerning His promise. What promise? That Jesus will come again. But He's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's patience. And notice that word, God's long-suffering. God may have spared the world one more day just so you would have an opportunity. I don't know that. But have you ever thought, what if He did and you neglected it and you missed heaven because God's patience wore out? I think one of the saddest things would be to hear the voice of those who begged and pleaded with you to make your life right and you never did do it. And then God's patience wore out and you were lost forever. But then there's a third thing. God demands obedience. Now, a lot of people don't like that, but you know what? God has the right to demand anything of man. He's the Almighty God, and we're the creation, and He's the Creator. He can tell me what to do. And when God looked down to Noah, He said, when you build the ark, you use gopher wood. He specified the pattern. And Noah moved by faith in exactly what God said to do. That's brought out in Hebrews 11. Suppose he used some other other kind of wood or he changed the pattern, then my friend, he wouldn't have been saved. Now look what Lot did. In Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot was told to leave the city and do not look back. Why? I don't know, but Lot had to obey. And when his wife disobeyed, God turned her into a pillar of salt. God didn't tell Lot to see any sense in what he was telling him to. He just told Lot to do it. Now the question is, did Noah and Lot receive the grace of God? Absolutely they did. When? When they obeyed God. Today, can we receive the grace of God? Oh yes. When? When we obey God by faith. We're saved by grace through faith, as is Ephesians 2. So I have to put my faith to act. And when one is baptized into Christ, God's grace blots out the sin. In Colossians 2 it said, it's the work of God that takes away our sin. But that brings up another thought. And this is an important principle. We've noticed three. We've seen three thus far. We first see that sin grieves God. And secondly, we see that God's patience is limited. Then we see that God demands obedience. But look at that fourth one. God's going to judge you. God will judge man. And he will punish man who does not obey. Some say God won't send anyone to hell. Oh, yes, my friend, he will. He will judge man in the day of judgment. Open your Bible and look at what Jesus said and let the record state the belief of Jesus in Matthew 24. 
Jesus believed in the flood. Jesus talked about the flood. And notice what he says in verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. I'll tell you something, my friend. Notice he said he took them all away. God judged them. And you know, one day we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And it's eternal principle that God will punish the wicked who do not repent. But notice it's a principle that God will bless those who live righteously and repent of their sins and see their need for God and try to please God and try to glorify God. Noah was blessed because he obeyed God. Lot was a righteous man and was spared destruction. And today, God is the one who will judge. And the righteous will enter into eternal life because they follow Jesus. And it's eternal principle that God will reward and punish man according to man's faith and obedience in God. Now there are four principles you can put down. After death, there will be the judgment. Hebrews 9.27 tells us that. 2 Corinthians 5.10 said, We all must stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give account to our deeds, whether they be good or whether they be evil. And I want to know what you know, my friend. Where God places you will be eternal. These principles are eternal. But I'll tell you that in the day of judgment, when you hear your sins, that will be forever. Whether it be heaven, whether it be hell, that sins will endure for all eternity. Question, are you ready to meet? Let us pray. Our Father, we're so thankful for the many blessings of life and we're mindful of your eternal principles. May we, Father, see that sin grieves you and that we do our best, Father, not to hurt you, but to glorify you and to give you honor and praise. And we're so sorry, Father, for our sin. Our hearts break when we stop and realize how much we are engaged in iniquity, how much we rebel against you, how selfish we sometimes can be. And we ask and beg you pardon us. Blot that out from us. Help us, dear Father, to turn from that so that we can honor you. We're mindful, Father, that not only does sin grieve you, but we're mindful, Father, that we must obey you. And we pray, Father, that there are any who are outside the ark of safety, that they would obey the gospel this very day. And we're mindful, Father, not only of that, but we're mindful that you are limited in your patience. You give us time, but there will come a time no more. Then will be the judgment. May we live, Father, that in that day of judgment we hear, well done, good and faithful servant. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.